Now we know what some of the different types of flat files are. Let's try out reading them into R. There are two general functions in the readR package that we can use to read these in, depending on whether we're working with a delimited or a fixed file format. I'll share with you some more specific functions we can use as well if we know exactly what type of delimiter we're using, but we'll start with these because that le leaves you just two to have to remember as you get started. Even when we use these, we'll often need to tell R exactly how to read the file in. So for example, if it's a delimited file, what the delimiter is, or if it's fixed width, how wide each of the columns is. So let's take a try at doing this, and I'm going to use a couple of files during our session today. I want to start by showing you how you can find those and download them yourself. These are all available through the GitHub page for this book. So if you go to github.com, in my account, there is an R Programming for Research repository. This has all of the files for the book, the online book. There is a data section in this. If you go to data, you can see we've got all of the files here. So today we're going to be using this file, the AWOIS Rex known year. Let's take a look at how you can get that. If you click on that, one of your options is raw. This gives you a version that, that you can save as a, a um, flat file. So you can go to save page as, and then you wanna make sure that it's text rather than saving it in a different for, file format. The other file that we'll be using is the Daily Show Guest. In class, you've already tried out using this file in your in-class exercise last week. You can get that one in the same way. So I've already grabbed those. For right now, I've put them on my desktop. Later in the class, we're gonna be looking at some much better ways to save data files inside a specific project directory so that we don't have to put them on our desktop or put them in a random place that's hard to find later. But for right now, this will work okay. So let's go in and we can take a look. The other thing that we need to do later this week, we're going to be talking a lot about how you can navigate through the different files on your computer when you need to find them to read them in. But for right now, we want to do it a little bit of a simpler way. So we'll do what's called setting our working directory and we'll set it to wherever we save those data files, either our desktop or maybe you save them in documents or some other common place. So, to find out what working directory you're in, you can use getwd, that stands for get working directory. And again, we will be covering this in a lot more detail in later slides. You can see now that I'm in my home directory. We can then set our working directory using setwd, and we can specify we want to go in our home directory, which I, I'm using a tilde for. And right now I'm gonna go into desktop just to check to make sure that we really do have the files where we think we were we can do list.files. That will list all the files in our current working directory. And you can see we've got these two file names in. So we're all set up now for being able to do the next step of reading the data in. The first file that we're going to look at is this one with Rex in the middle of it. We can already see it ends in .tab. That gives us a sneaking suspicion that this might be a tab separated value. And indeed it is. So we will need to know that as we read it in. This is a file that's been collected of shipwrecks. Um, I grew up near the Outer Banks of North Carolina, and that's an area called the Graveyard of the Atlantic because there have been so many shipwrecks off that area. So I'm really fascinated with, with this particular file. It has the location of different known shipwrecks, and if they know, it's got the date when that vessel sank. So it's really interesting to explore, especially if you're taking a trip somewhere near the coast. So again, you can download this from the GitHub page and hopefully you can save this and try along yourself. Once you have this in your working directory or you've put it someplace and then move to your working directory to be there, we'll want to read it in and then we'll assign it to a specific object name. We're gonna use the, the uh, read our package to do this. So if you haven't already, you'll want to install that package with install.packages and then read our. 
Once you've done that, we need to load the package and then we'll read this in. So I'm gonna open a new script. I'll do that with new file and R script. This way I can save this process of reading in the data if I wanted to use it later. So I'll load that package up here. I like to load my packages at the beginning of my script so I can see very quickly what packages are there and if I share it, somebody else can see quickly if there are any packages that they need to install before they can run the rest of this, the script. All right, so next we're gonna read in that data file. We can do that with read underscore delim. We know this is a delimited file. It's a tab separated one. So we're gonna use that read underscore delim from reader. Now I can put in quotation marks, and RStudio does something really wonderful here. Once you put in quotation marks, if you press the tab key, it will tell you all the files that are an option in your current working directory. So instead of having to type out this whole thing, I can just click on it. The next thing that I'll need to do, if you're using read underscore delim, you do need to let it know what the delimiter is. So the option for that is called uh, delim, D-E-L-I-M. If I wanted to, I could look at the help file for read underscore delim to figure that out. But with our studio, you can also use tab completion. So if you press tab again, it gives you the different parameters you can use for the function that you're in the process of writing a call for. So if I scroll down to delim, I can see that here I can put in the character that's being used to separate values in the field. So I'll click on that. And then this is the last tricky part for this particular file. We know it's tab separated, but we can't just put in the tab key here. We need to give it the actual underlying kind of code that the computer thinks of. So there are some special characters. For a tab, it is a backslash and a T. For a space, it's a backslash and an S. So this little code here, backslash T, means that we want to use tabs. Later, we'll look at reading in comma separated values. In that case, we can put a comma in without any special other character. So let's try running that. Again, I'm using the keyboard shortcut command return to run this, but you could also put your cursor on this line and do run, or you could highlight the piece that you wanna run, and then again, click run. If we look down here, we can see that it's read it in. So the first thing that it gives us is it gives us some information about what it was doing. This can be a little bit alarming when, when it happens at first because you think you might have had an error because you get back information when you do it. But this is just where that function has gone through and for each of the columns, it's tried to figure out what type of data is in that column. If you'll remember from before, with data frames, all of the values in a specific column have to have the same type. This is where the function um, is trying to be clever and help you out by figuring those out. But you can take a look and see if that looks right. So you can see double, that's a specific type of numeric. We can see some that came through as characters. You can check that and make sure that things look okay for your data set. Down below it, we didn't assign this when we read it in to any particular object. So what happens is that R prints it out directly. It doesn't save it with an object name for us to use later. It just prints it right back out of the console so we can take a look at it. So you can see here, we have our different column names. This all looks like it came through well. And then we have numbers in each of those. And again, there's some information about what each of those columns, what data type it was put into. So we can see again here that we have double, which is a special type of numeric, and we have character. This is another place where you can check to make sure that it brought in the data in the type that you, you wanted in. All right, so the next step, we're probably going to want to use this data again. So it would be really helpful for us to give it an object name so we can just call that instead of having to read it every time. So I'm gonna call this shipwrecks, try to spell it correctly. And there's our assignment arrow, our gets arrow. So I can run this and now we can see, um, first of all, over here in the environment, we can take a look and we see that shipwrecks is there. We've got 197 rows, we've got 10 variables. We can also use that LS to list all of the objects and we can see that we have that in as an object now. This family of functions, there are a number of parameters we might find useful. We just looked at the delim, but here's some of the others. 
One is skip. There might, we'll look at a case of this in just a second, but there'll be some cases where a file will start with a number of rows that you just don't need, and it might confuse R to read those in. For many of these functions, R is assuming that the very first line gives the column names. If that's not the case, if there's other gunk at the top of the file, then you need to skip that to get to the place where you want to start. The next is related to those column names again. You can specify with call underscore names, which stands for column names, you can specify if you would like that first row to be used as column names. There may be some cases where somebody tells you what each of the columns are, but names for the columns are not put in the file. In that case, you could put false or you could put in with column names, you could actually put in a, a character vector the same length as the number of columns that says what each of those columns should be, be named. If you would like to specify what data type each column is, you can do that as well. As we just saw, the function tries to guess that for you, but if it's not doing well, you can spell out exactly what each one should be. You can also set the number, the maximum number of rows that you want to put in. This is particularly useful if you have a huge file. What you can do is you can start by just reading in the first 10 lines. You can use that code to make sure you've got all of your other options like DLIM and skip and call names that you've got all of those set. And then once you get everything right, then you can move towards reading in the whole file. Otherwise, really large files can sometimes take a little bit of time to load each time, and so it becomes very frustrating to get all of your other parameters right if you're having to wait each time for that. Finally, you can use the NA option to specify how missing values are coded. Sometimes they're missing, but in some cases, people might have used a special value for that. I work with a lot of weather data, and sometimes they will use negative 99 or negative 999 to specify a missing value. I would rather not have to read in the data and then clean that up, so instead I can specify with the NA function that that's how data with that particular value should be handled in the file. So let's take a look at that idea of skipping a few lines, of using some of these parameters. So the other file we're going to look at is called daily show guest. It's a comma separated value. And we looked at it a little bit already in an in-class exercise. So you might be a little bit familiar with it already. On the version that I have with the book, I've got several lines where I put the information about where I got this data. It's under a Creative Commons attribution license. And so I'm free to share it along as long as I attribute. And so I've done that right here. Um, so you can see as you get down to line five, this is where we really want the data. We want to skip everything above it, but then we want to start with the column names on the fifth row and then have everything after. So what we can do when we do read DLIM, we can specify that we would like to skip the first four rows. When we do that, it reads in everything like we want. So we can take a look at that or doing that here. Again, we'll use read DLIM. We can get the file name. The DLIM in this case is a comma. So again, that's just a comma in the quotation marks. And then we want to skip four, four of the rows. So we can run that and we can see down in the console, everything looks great. What would happen if we had missed that? So we can run right here. You can see that it read in only one column because it was basing that decision on the first line that it read. It's trying to put everything in together here. And so we get something that's not gonna be very useful for us to work with. So it's really important that we do that skip equals four as we read this in. So we talked about using read DLIM when we have a delimited file. We do have to specify DLIM every time though, if it's a comma or a tab or, or whatever. There are some special functions that save you a little bit of time. These are doing the same thing. They, the only difference is, is in their default value for what the delimiter is. So it just saves you a little bit of typing. If your brain's already full with remembering stuff at the start of this class, feel free to just use read DLIM and then you can come back to these later. But if you're feeling comfortable with that, you might wanna go ahead and, and remember these as they'll save you a little bit of time. So if you're reading in a comma separated file, there is read underscore CSV. 
if you're reading one in with semicolons, there's read CSV too. Um, and this is a type of format that's used sometimes, especially in European files, where they sometimes use a comma instead of a decimal to separate um, the, the, the units in a number. There's also read underscore table two that works with white space and read underscore TSV for tab delimited files. So here's an example of doing that. You can see that we've got read delim, the, the call that we just did where we specified delim. You can take that out if you use read CSV. So these two calls are doing exactly the same thing. The only difference here is that by using read CSV, we don't have to specify what the delimiter is because for that function, the default for the delimiter is that it's a comma. If you have um, data in a fixed width format, you can read that in with read underscore FWF and read underscore table. These let you specify the widths for each of the fields. So in other words, how many spaces you should count across for the first column and then how many for the second column and so on. Some of these will try to guess those when you read in a file and sometimes that works and sometimes it, it doesn't, but you can always specify it by hand when you read in data that way. So far, we've talked only about reading in data from flat files, but there are some nice functions for reading it in from binary files that you might get from people who are using other types of software for data analysis. For example, there's a read Excel file from the read Excel package. From the Haven package, there are a number of different functions that let you read in from SAS, SPSS, and Stata. So again, if you're working on a team where people are using different software for their data analysis, these can be a really useful way to read in the files that, that they share with you. Once you read the data in, you should check it out a little bit just to make sure that it came in without bugs. We're going to be doing that with some of the packages from dplyr, so here I've loaded that. And let's take a look over here. So we, when we read in the data initially, you can see that it prints that out right away. And if you have something saved as an object like we did with shipwrecks, you can put that object name in and print it. And that will print out directly as well. You might want to do some things to explore a limited set of it though. One, we can look at slice. And this is going to let us look at just a few of the rows. So we can say our data is shipwrecks. And then we pick out which, which of the, the rows we want to do. So maybe let's do um, 1, 3, and 10. So we can, oh, sorry. I forgot to load that package. There we go. All right, so now we can run that and we can see that it prints out only three of the rows. So this lets us look a little bit at, at um, a smaller set. We might also want to look at just some of the columns. This might particularly be something you want to do if you have a lot of columns. So you can do that again with shipwrecks. And then again, we can do that by location. So if we wanted to do the fourth through the sixth columns, we can run that. And now you can see it's picked out just that. Again, as we looked at in previous slides, we can nest these together. So we could actually take this slice call and put it in for our data value in the select and then run that. And you can see now we, we've narrowed down both by slicing out certain rows and just selecting a few of the columns. The next thing we can use is from base R. This is called the head function. This will let you take this will let you take a data frame or other R objects and look at just the first part of it. So we can run like this. The default is it will show the first six rows, but we can also change that behavior. If we wanted to see the first 10 rows, we can set that. And the, the argument for that is actually um, n equals. So we can do n equals 10. Now we're seeing 10. If we only wanted to see the first three, we could set that to three. And then, and I think this one is particularly useful when you're reading in a data set. We can look at just the end the same way. So like that one was called head, this one is called the tail function. So we can replace that right here and run tail. We can see these are the last few rows that were read in. 
This is helpful because a lot of times if an error happens when you're reading in data, it, it happens somewhere along the, the way. So you don't get the same last rows as you were expecting because something happened along the way to stop the data being read in. So this is really helpful, I think, for seeing that. The last thing that we want to look at, we can use DIM. Again, this stands for dimensions. So we can use DIM right here, the shipwrecks. And you can see that that's got almost 200 rows and 10 columns. If we know our data, we would have an idea if that seems like about the right dimensions for this data set in terms of a check. 